Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Catholicism. Today, I am here with Catholic apologist Dave Armstrong. Dave, it's really good to have you on the channel. And also, when I was becoming Catholic, your work was a huge help for me. The way that you cited biblical scholars, uh, I, I especially remember, I would, I and I still do actually often go back to your uh, post on, what is it, uh, biblical scholars affirm the that Peter is the rock and the primacy of Peter, something like that. Yeah. And so... Just the amount of research you put in and just the thoroughness of it and how well you understand, I think, Protestantism. I mean, it's really to be commended. So, Dave, it's a huge honor to have you on the show. Well, it's my pleasure, and thanks for the kind words. Well, Dave, before we get started, could you just briefly uh, introduce yourself, like where we can find your work and what you'll be talking about today? Yeah, my blog is on Pathios, which is a very large site, and it's called Biblical Evidence for Catholicism. Um, I get I don't I don't know the URL offhand. It's just in a search you can find it, or just put my name in Google and stuff comes up. And I write for National Catholic Register two twice a month. Those are my main activities, along with Facebook. Mm -hmm. And how did you get into this topic on, you know, Jerome and, and bishops and all that with Gavin Ortland? I just happened to see that he had written about that. And I love that sort of historical discussion because uh, when I give my conversion story, I always say it was Newman's essay on development mm -hmm. that really made me a Catholic. And, and it's actually my favorite subject which is sort of ironic because I'm sort of known as this Bible and Catholicism guy. Mm. But I, I really love talking about history and especially development. Well, Dave, I'll let you do your presentation. And if I have any questions at the end, I'll say them. But Dave, you take it away. Okay. Uh, my written response to Gavin on my blog is called St. Jerome, Papacy and Succession. Probably the links will be here later on. It has most of the references with links that I'll be referring to and more material that's not in this presentation. Gavin's a good debater. I differ with him on premises and conclusions drawn from what I think are false premises. Catholics have premises too, of course, everybody does. Um, we all need to examine our own premises more closely to see if they can withstand scrutiny. Now, this word uh, monepiscopacy, or monoepiscopacy, as Gavin says, it's a 50-cent word meaning one bishop for each city or area. The Greek biblical word for bishop is episkopos. From, we get episcopalian from that. Um, now, Gavin claims that St. Jerome said things that imply that this was not the case in the earliest days of the church. So, for example, he wrote in his blog article related to this YouTube video, uh, quote, Jerome's commentary on Titus 1.5 contains an important testimony about the development of the monoepiscopacy in the early church, in addition to various statements in his letters, unquote. So in Titus 1.5, I use RSV for my Bible. Paul directed Titus to appoint elders in every town. The Greek word there is presbyter, or uh, pres presbuteros, I think in Greek, which is basically a priest or a pastor. Then Paul goes on to mention bishop in verses 7 through 9. So he seems to be using the two terms synonymously or interchangeably. And that's Gavin's argument in a nutshell that Jerome is following Paul, meaning that the two terms are describing the same office. And so Gavin argues, there goes hierarchical church government where bishops are higher than elders, priests, and pastors. This is why there's no bishops at all in the Baptist tradition, uh, which is Gavin is reformed Baptist himself. Um, the, another reformed Baptist apologist, James White, pretty well known, he wrote to me in a letter many years ago that he himself was a bishop. He actually used that word. He's usually referred to as an elder 
in his circles, but he believes that bishops and elders or presbyters are the same office according to scripture. That's really what this debate is about. Now in Jerome's commentary on Titus 1.5, he, this is quoting Jerome now, he refers to, quote, the very same priest who is a bishop and also bishop and priest are one. He asserts that Paul, be, or before Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, quote, the churches were governed by a common council of the priests. Jerome also noted that Luke in the book of Acts called the priests in Ephesus elders, Acts 20, 17, and wrote that Paul sent for them, whereas Paul himself calls the same priests overseers, that's the word episkopos there, who care for the church of God, Acts 20, 28. So that settles it, right? Well, if these are the only things we read in Jerome's commentary, it would, but that's not all there is there. Gavin, to his credit, includes the entire context, five paragraphs of Jerome's words. And in the context, I submit that Jerome explains what he means by these observations and does so in a way completely harmonious with the Catholic view. Uh, we all, people tend to highlight things that they agree with when you're looking up these quotes. That's why we always need to look at the entire context and compare a given patristic citation with comments from the same church father elsewhere in his writings. Just as we compare Bible passages on the same topic, Jerome also wrote in the same passage that early on in church history in the first century, quote, it was decreed for the whole world that one of the priests should be elected to preside over the others to whom the entire care of the church should pertain. That's in the same larger quote that Gavin um, brought up from Jerome. In other words, Jerome was saying that when Paul was writing his letters, references to church offices were sometimes used interchangeably, but that very soon the tendency was towards single bishops in cities and areas. Thus, this particular commentary doesn't prove that Jerome denied mon episcopacy. Quite the contrary, he not only describes it, but entirely agrees with it, as I will soon show, because he also stated, quote, at that time, they were called the same men bishops whom they also called priests. Therefore, he has spoken indifferently of bishops as if of priests, unquote. The time Jerome is referring to is when Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians. Scholars believe the date of that was late 50s or early 60s. Jerome isn't talking about his own belief. He was describing how the terminology for church offices was used in the mid first century but also noting that it soon changed or developed into a system of e episcopacy. Then Jerome expressed for the third time, quote, to the men of old, the same men who were priests were also the bishops, but gradually, there's a key word, as the seed beds of dissensions were eradicated, all solicitude was conferred on one man. Now these quotes that I'm giving are all in the same passage. So my point is that Gavin is highlighting one part of it, but he's not taking into account these other things that were also part of it. Note that the word gradually is essentially describing the process of development of doctrine. But then Jerome expressed something that actually supports one of Gavin's views and those of many Protestants. This is Jerome again, quote, just as the priests know that by the custom of the church, they are subject to the one who was previously appointed over them. So the bishops know that they, more by custom than by the truth of the Lord's arrangement, are greater than the priests. So he's reiterating bishops are greater than the priests, priests are subject to them. But he's saying that this is only a custom rather than, quote, the Lord's arrangement. Gavin and many Protestants believe that there is no single God-ordained system of ecclesiology or church government described in Holy Scripture. And here he claims that Jerome agrees with that. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, teaches that ecclesiology is included in the ap apostolic deposit. 
Therefore, a hierarchical and Episcopal church, including the Pope, is ordained by God. So that that's the discussion right there. How would Catholics respond to that? Well, I would by saying that Jerome simply got this aspect wrong. We don't regard individual church fathers as infallible. They get things wrong. So Jerome was in error. So it seems, at least in this excerpt, about eccles ecclesiology being God-ordained. Jerome also didn't like the Deuterocanon, the seven books that Catholics include in the Old Testament that Protestants reject. He didn't want to include it in his Vulgate translation, but he eventually bowed to church authority and did so. But even then, it wasn't cut and dried um, because in various places he cited the books of Tobit, Sirach, Wisdom, and First and Second Maccabees as if they were scripture. And he quoted one of Baruch's proclamations as having been, quote, made by the trumpets of the prophets. That's from letter 77, section 4. Lastly, Jerome wrote in his commentary on Titus 1.5, quote, they ought to rule the church commonly in imitation of Moses, who, when he had under his authority to preside alone over the people of Israel, he chose the 70 by whom he could judge the people, unquote. That may seem at first glance to support Gavin's view of government by elders, group of elders, but it's actually fully in accord with the Catholic position. It's not an either or proposition, in other words. The Pope can be the supreme leader while working with bishops and priests, including in ecumenical council, to govern the church, just as in the U.S. political system, senators and representatives govern and pass bills which are subject to the presidential veto. Jerome stated that Moses had, quote, authority to preside alone. He simply chose others to assist him in governing by delegating authority, which is precise, precisely like the Pope and bishops, bishops having authority over priests in their domain. It doesn't follow that the Pope is not supreme. Jerome either was or may be wrong about church government merely being custom but he still bore strong witness to the dominance of Episcopacy early on. Jerome, what Jerome refers to in this commentary is, I believe, the fluidity of church offices in the New Testament. I wrote about the same thing 27 years ago, 1996, in my first book, A Biblical Defense of Catholicism. I even mentioned Titus 1.5, the very passage that Gavin brought up. Uh, that Jerome commented on. I wrote, as is often the case in theology and practice among the earliest Christians, there is some fluidity and overlapping of these three vocations. But this doesn't prove that three offices of ministry did not exist. For instance, St. Paul often referred to himself as a deacon or minister. Then I give about six verses. Yet no one would assert that he was merely a deacon and nothing else. That's all from my book, from 1996, so this is nothing new to me, nor does it refute what Catholics believe because the doctrine was to develop just as every other doctrine does and has. This being the case, not all would fully understand it in the earlier centuries of the church, but there are plenty of biblical indications of bishops and what their function was and biblical proof that bishops are the successors of the apostles. I've written about that, but I can't get into all that now. Jerome bears witness to the presence of Monepiscopacy starting almost immediately after the death of Jesus. There is plenty of evidence in his writings confirming what he thought was actually the case in early church history, as best he could determine it in from the fourth and fifth century when he lived, of how local churches were governed but first, let's see what Gavin claimed about this. In his video, at uh, 14 minutes and 26 seconds, he said, quote, All of his proof texts for the synonymy of presbyter and bishop are after 1 Corinthians. So if Jerome thought that the change to monoepiscopacy had, had happened around 50 AD, he wouldn't cite evidence against that model from the 60s. So to that, I respond that we should look at what Jerome actually wrote rather than indulge in mere speculation. So I found a treatise of his called 
on illustrious men, which had all kinds of information about, about this sort of thing. Uh, Jerome, in that work, wrote the following about St. James. James, after our Lord's passion, was at once ordained by the apostles, Bishop of Jerusalem, which is, this is me talking now, that's an explicit statement of apostolic succession. Then Jerome goes on, Heg Hegesippus, who lived near the apostolic age, well, he lived from 110 to 180 approximately. In the fifth book of his commentaries, writing of James says, after the apostles, James, the brother of, Lord, of the Lord, surnamed the just, was made head of the church at Jerusalem. And so he ruled the church of Jerusalem 30 years, unquote. So we can, we can know with a high degree of certainty exactly how early that was. Scholars believe that James was martyred in either 62 or 69 AD. Thus, 30 years as the Bishop of Jerusalem means that he assumed that role between 32 and 39 AD. And this is what Jerome himself believed. But there's a lot more than that. Jerome says about Peter from the same book in section one, quote, Simon Peter himself, chief of the apostles, after having been Bishop of the Church of Antioch, pushed on to Rome and held the sacerdotal chair there for 25 years until the last, that is the 14th year of Nero, unquote. Nero died in 68, his reign began in 54. Thus, according to Jerome, Peter was Bishop of Rome from 43 to 68 AD. Therefore, Jerome believed that sole bishops of cities were present in the 30s with James and 40s with Peter in Rome. Now, of course, that doesn't mean all cities, but at least some major ones had bishops in those times. But Gavin erroneously claimed that Jerome believed that monopiscopacy began, quote, in the mid third century. That's his view, but it's certainly not 50 AD, unquote. That's from his video at 19 minutes and 14 seconds. If that were in fact true, then Jerome couldn't mention any bishops ruling cities until around 250 AD. That's already massively disproven by the examples I just gave over 200 years earlier. But there's much more than that. In the same book, again, it's called On Illustrious Men. Jerome mentions many bishops before that time. He refers to Clement as the, quote, Bishop of the Church of Rome. Clement lived from around 35 to 99. And he refers to Papias or Papias, who lived from 60 to 130 as, quote, Bishop of Hierapolis. He says that Clement was the fourth Bishop of Rome after Peter, and that the second was Linus, who died around 76. And the third, Anacletus, who died around 92. Jerome thought that Ignatius, who died, uh, they think, between 110 and 117, was, quote, the third bishop of the Church of Antioch after Peter the Apostle. And that Polycarp, who lived from 69 to 155, was a, quote, disciple of the Apostle John and by him ordained bishop of Smyrna. This is a second explicit proof of apostolic succession in Jerome's writings because John ordained Polycarp. Yet Gavin stated at 651 in his video that, quote, Jerome is against apostolic succession in its common definitions. It goes on and on. In the same book, Jerome noted how Agesippus died around 180 went to Rome in the time of Anicetus, who died in 168, the 10th bishop after Peter, and continued there till the time of Eleutherius. He died in either 185 or 193, bishop of the same city who had been deacon under Anicetus. Note here how he specifically differentiates de a deacon and bishop at a time before 193, Melito of Asia, who died around 180, was, quote, Bishop of Sardis. Theophilus, died 183 to 185, was, quote, sixth Bishop of Antioch. 
Apollinaris, second century, was a bishop of Hierapolis in Asia. Dionysius, flourish in 171, was, quote, bishop of the Church of Corinth. He mentioned several others as bishop who lived before 250. Uh, Philip of Crete, Pope Victor, who, quote, ruled the church for 10 years. Demetrius and Clement of Alexandria, Alexander of Jerusalem, Serapion of Antioch, and Theophilus of Caesarea. All of these are before 250, which is when he claims that Jerome thought the Monopiscopacy began. Uh, in the same work, 106 additional and similar uses of bishop occur. Some specifically assume the contrast between bishop and presbyter, the former being a higher office. For example, he noted that Origen, who died around 253, had, quote, been ordained presbyter by Theoc Theoctistus and Alexander, bishops of Caesarea and Jerusalem. Jerome also wrote in his letter 146 to Evangelist, a letter that Gavin mentioned, quote, even at Alexandria from the time of Mark the Evangelist until the episcopates of Heraclius and Dionysius, the presbyters always named as bishop one of their own number, chosen by themselves and set in a more exalted position, just as an army elects a general, unquote. Tradition holds that Mark founded the Church of Alexandria around 49, and Jerome is already calling him a bishop. According to Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History 2.24.1, Mark was succeeded by Anianus as the bishop of Alexandria in the eighth year of Nero, which is 62 or 63. Then Jerome makes a very interesting analogy. Quote, in fact, as if to tell us that the traditions handed down by the apostles were taken by them from the Old Testament, bishops, presbyters, and deacons occupy in the church the same positions as those which were occupied by Aaron, his sons, and Levites in the temple, unquote. Now this tells us two things. Perhaps Jerome did believe, after all, that hierarchy and episcopacy were of divine and apostolic origin and that how ecclesiology in the church was developing, suggesting that the analogy of the Old Testament is precisely about hierarchical authority, with Aaron being similar to a bishop. Thus, it seems that Jerome was either self-contradictory regarding these matters, like he was with the Deuterocanon, or he changed his position. Now, another thing Gavin does is he makes a great deal out of the fact that Jerome referred to presbyters electing bishops. But I would say that's neither here nor there. It's not necessarily how they are elected, but the fact that the very notion of a bishop above presbyters is upheld. Catholic cardinals, of course, vote on decrees of ecumenical councils and they vote for popes. It doesn't follow that there are no such decrees or popes because votes were taken to establish them. I think a big part of the problem is that Gavin wrongly dichotomizes apostolic and development of doctrine. So for example, he states at 2746 in his video, this is why when people defend Episcopal church government and apostolic succession, they often do so as a Holy Spirit led development rather than something that's literally apostolic like the apostles themselves commanded it, unquote. His use of the word rather proves that he's drawing the false dichotomy, but they're not separate or in conflict at all. Apostolic doctrines develop, they remain the same in essence by definition when they do so. The Catholic view is that bishops are the successors of the apostles. There are various biblical arguments for that. How they're elected or appointed is a separate and non-essential question that doesn't work against apostolic succession. But Gavin seems to mistakenly think that it does. By analogy, you have a U.S. senator in American government, the same political office, even though at one time they were appointed by governors, and then they started being elected by the public. Things also develop at different rates in different places. Jerusalem and Rome had sole bishops very early on. Other regions took longer. 
this is to be expected and poses no problem for Catholic ecclesiology. Gavin stated at 2246 in his video, quote, apostolic succession requires ordination from a bishop. Well, that's not necessarily the case at all times and places for the doctrine to be true. The doctrine is that bishops are successors of the apostles and authority. Ordination is itself a doctrine and we believe a sacrament. So it developed as well. In the early centuries, it was still developing. So we would fully expect to see different applications and even some disagreements. Some folks simply got things wrong, in other words. In Catholic thinking, development of doctrine is simply the way in which the divine institution unfolds. It's always misunderstood by some in earlier stages and increasingly is understood as time goes on. This is true in all cases of development of all doctrines. St. John Henry Newman's analysis of the development of both episcopacy and the papacy explains the nature of this process in history. Now quoting him, from his essay on the development of Christian doctrine. While apostles were on earth, there was a display neither of bishop nor pope. Their power had no prominence as being exercised by apostle. In course of time, first the power of the bishop displayed itself and then the power of the pope. Then a little later he says, first local disturbances gave exercise to bishops and next ecumenical disturbances gave exercise to popes and whether communion with the Pope was necessary for Catholicity would not and could not be debated till a suspension of that communion had actually occurred. It is a less difficulty that the papal supremacy was not formally acknowledged in the second century than that there was no formal acknowledgement on the part of the Church of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity till the fourth. No doctrine is defined till it is violated. So he's saying that, uh, well, I'll put it this way, many Protestants casually assume that development of doctrine is fundamentally opposed to the notion of the apostolic deposit. Catholics accept both things and believe that they are entirely harmonious. Cardinal Newman used as his jumping off point regarding his theory of development, the work of St. Vincent of Lorraine died around 445 and his work called the Commonatorium. It contained what is called his dictum. Um, Anglicans will often cite this. It says, we hold that faith which has been believed everywhere, always and by all. That's chapter two, section six of that work. This was a general statement of principle not to be taken absolutely literally. But what many don't realize in the same work, St. Vincent expressed the most explicit statement of development of doctrine to be found in the church fathers. Quote, the growth of religion in the soul must be analogous to the growth of the body, which though in process of years, it is developed and attains its full size, yet remains still the same. There is a wide difference between the flower of youth and the maturity of age. Yet they who were once young are still the same now that they have become old, insomuch that Though the stature and outward form of the individual are changed, yet his nature is one and the same. His person is one and the same. In like manner, it behoves Christian doctrine to follow the same laws of progress so as to be consolidated by years, enlarged by time, refined by age, and yet withal to continue uncorrupt and unadulterate, complete and perfect in all the measurement of its parts, and so to speak, in all its proper members and senses, admitting no change, no waste of its distinctive property, no variation in its limits. That's from chapter 23, sections 55 and 56. So there's no conflict between believing in that the apostles received the fullness of Christianity and passed down these beliefs and development of doctrine where progress and understanding occurs, but nothing essential changes. In other words, development of doctrine isn't evolution of doctrine where one thing turns into something else fundamentally different. And I think I'll stop there. There's a little more, but that should do it for now.
All right, Dave. Um, let me just ask you a few things, and then I think we can wrap it up from there. And eventually, if uh, people in the audience want to ask questions, I can gather up those questions, present them to you, and then we can maybe do this again another time. How does that okay. sound? Yeah, okay. Sure. Um, so, Dave, before we end today's episode, just two things really quick. One is maybe if there's anything, is there anything else you want to say before we end the episode? And second, uh, just for the audience again, where can we find your work? Uh, it's my blog, Biblical Evidence for Catholicism on Pathios and uh, National Catholic Review. And my name's all over Google because I'm always checking things myself. And so if you put my name, it'd be easy to get to my blog. And that's about it for me. I guess I don't have much more to say on it. 